Welcome to the Site Reliability, or SRE, learning path here at Microsoft Ignite the Tour. I'm thrilled that you're here with us and kicking off this learning path with us. That includes five sessions today. Operations is fundamentally changing. It's modernizing. And your competitors are adopting new ways of delivering software faster and more reliably. DevOps and SRE are two approaches of doing just that, accelerating your software delivery lifecycle. And in many ways, SRE is the natural evolution of DevOps, with a few twists and turns along the way. I'm Emily Freeman. I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft, which is just a fancy way of saying that I'm a software engineer whose job it is to speak to you and bring feedback back to our product teams so that we ensure we build the best products for you all. You can find me on Twitter at Editing Emily. We're going to cover a lot of ground today during the five sessions of this learning path, and it's probable that you'll have some questions along the way. Each of us will be available at the stage after our talks, but you're welcome to reach out to us on Twitter, specifically me, and if I can't answer your question directly, I'll connect you with someone who can. We're kicking off today with modernizing your infrastructure by moving to infrastructure as code, or IAC. I like to joke that I'm from the dev side of DevOps, but if you come from an operations background, you may not feel super comfortable with coding and things like source control, and that's okay. I want to assure you that no matter what your background, there is room for everyone to thrive. And we're working hard to make sure that Azure is the place that you all can come together as a team so that you can deliver software better and faster and usually cheaper. If you've worked in a traditional engineering environment like me, you'll be used to ticket-based workflows and silos. Those responsibilities where developers create the code and then toss it over to operations to deploy and maintain. The reason I moved into DevOps from back-end engineering is I became increasingly frustrated with the friction and seemingly endless back and forth between developers and operations teams. It was obviously their fault. I mean, I was fine. <laughs> Definitely an ops problem. DevOps seeks to reduce or eliminate the friction that exists between developers and operations engineers in that environment. I think to be successful, we have to work together. DevOps has been around for 10 years now. 10 years. We've been talking about this for a really long time. And yet the definition of DevOps still varies from company to company and person to person. I'm nearly finished writing my book, DevOps for Dummies, 75% of the way through, final stretch. And I think for me, DevOps can be encapsulated as an engineering culture of collaboration, ownership, and learning with the purpose of accelerating the software delivery lifecycle from ideation to production. Effective DevOps, written by my colleague Jennifer Davis, describes it as a cultural movement that changes how individuals think about their work, values the diversity of work done, supports intentional processes that accelerate the rate by which businesses realize value, and measures the effect of social and technical change. There's also Colms, which lists the core values of DevOps. Culture, automation, lean, measurement, and sharing. A positive learning culture where people feel safe to make mistakes and learn from failure without getting fired is the foundation of DevOps. Automation is where Azure can begin to accelerate that life cycle for you. Site Reliability Engineering, or SRE, is a discipline originating from Google's approach to service management. But SRE has evolved beyond its original form and is implemented differently across the industry. We all like to do things a little bit different. 
You can think of SRE as a specific and prescriptive implementation of DevOps. Site reliability engineering is a discipline devoted to helping an organization sustainably achieve the appropriate level of reliability in their systems, services, and products. It encompasses almost all areas of operations, availability, latency, performance, efficiency, change management, monitoring, emergency response, and capacity planning. In his book, The Phoenix Project, Gene Kim noted, a great team doesn't mean that they had the smartest people. What made those teams great was that everyone trusted one another. And it can be a powerful thing when that magic dynamic exists. When was the last time you felt like that? Think back, have you ever felt like that? And if you have, and you really truly felt fulfilled in your work, what did that feel like? How did trust in your colleagues play a role in that? If you think failure is a choice, you're wrong. I'll talk more about that later today. I think we've all messed up at some point, right? We've pushed buggy code, we've gotten tangled while rebasing the Git, we've deleted a production database, small things, little problems. Now we're moving all our legacy systems to the cloud. Some of us faster than others, and that's okay. In the cloud, sometimes it's rainy. You'll learn about responding and monitoring in the cloud in SRE 30. And at the end of the day, I'll close out this learning path again with SRE 50 in learning from failure and responding to incidents. Once your team actually trusts each other, using that cultural foundation of DevOps, collaboration can become the norm. And only then can innovation truly take place. Before I continue, I want to impress on you that transforming your organization to DevOps and SRE is not a zero to perfect process. It's messy, it's turning a big boat. The changes you see may be small at first, but if you stick with it and measure your progress as a team holistically, when you focus on your people, you'll see significant changes in your culture and eventually velocity. It used to be that we worked in a waterfall process, right? We moved from one stage to the next in a very linear fashion. It was neat, it was clean, it was ineffective. Then we adopted Agile, and from Agile evolved DevOps. Now we think more in a circular fashion, right? And we create feedback loops around the customer, centering our users to ensure that their feedback drives our product roadmaps. We develop small batches of code now, not enormous releases. We automate our tests instead of clicking through every single time before we deploy. We now release frequently to customers and loop back to various stages of the life cycle as appropriate. Whereas DevOps looks at the system as a whole, SRE is a much more prescriptive approach and focused in operations, heavily in the deployment and maintenance phases. That focus on infrastructure is what we're gonna to cover today. The cloud has certainly changed some things. You provision resources via APIs, not purchase orders. You scale via APIs. You deploy via an API, not instructions buried somewhere in your internal docs that haven't truly been updated in three years. The cloud basically reigns APIs. I mean, you get an API and you get an API. And that's because infrastructure as code has become a way to automate infrastructure management in a sustainable fashion. You can track changes to code, or let's be real, usually a YAML file, via source control which makes it more consistent. And you can keep track of who's changing what instead of clicking around in the portal, which can cause some disruptions. SRE at that point becomes repeatable, fast, scalable, self-service, and automated. Let's go back to that definition of SRE for just a minute. I wanna highlight a part. Appropriate level of reliability. 
Cool, sounds good. But what does that actually mean, really? Except in rare cases, 100% reliability is never the right goal. Unless it's life or death, it usually isn't. It feels wrong somehow, but it's not. 100% reliability is often unreachable because dependencies aren't 100% reliable. It's really expensive to reach that level of reliability, and it leaves you with no room for error. Finally, there's this word, sustainably. You want to sustainably achieve the appropriate level of reliability. SRE, like DevOps, recognizes that it is crucial that an operations practice takes into account the people doing the work. Your systems will not be reliable if your team is burnt out from inhumane on-call rotations and impossible to meet deadlines that stress cascades and compounds. Interruptions distract engineers from work that increases reliability. They're reacting always instead of thinking and having the time and energy to think proactively. Reducing or eliminating toil is part of an SRE culture. This concept of toil comes up a lot. And it's defined as that manual, repetitive work you do every day, a week, a month, even every year. One of the most powerful ways to eliminate toil is to automate that work. If you're doing something twice, it's time to look into whether you can automate it. With code, we can automate those manual processes and make them reusable and managed via source control so that everyone can access it, learn, and search for the answer independently. There are no single points of failure on your team. I want to dive into a demo on provisioning infrastructure in Azure. The app we are using across the tour is called Tailwind Traders. You might have heard of it in other sessions. It has a Node backend and a React frontend. It utilizes Cosmos DB, SQL Server, and .NET. App Service, Azure's app hosting service, works seamlessly with .NET, .NET Core, Java, Ruby, Node, PHP, Python, Docker. We try and make it as easy as possible for you to use it. I'm going to manually set up the infrastructure in the Azure portal at first with an Azure Resource Manager, or ARM template. Azure Docs are great at helping you get up and running. I'm relatively new to Microsoft, and I use them all the time. I think they're incredibly helpful. If you are trying to do something similar to here or any of these sessions, I encourage you to look there if you're hitting errors. Provisioning infrastructure takes a few minutes, as you probably know. To spare you the bad dad jokes and awkwardly staring at each other during those moments, I've recorded the demos so I can speed up time and make it more efficient, walking you through each step. Okay, let's get going. So if you look here, I'm in my portal at Azure. My homepage is gonna look different than yours simply because of the services I use. You're gonna create a resource and head right over to the web app option. Click that. And then we're gonna create an app name. I'll focus it on the learning path number, SRE 10, and our location, or short for it, AMS. Then a manual deploy. And if you notice, the app name is replicated down at the bottom in the resource group automatically for you. You'll have to make sure that your subscription is correct. And then as far as the other options, I'm going to choose Linux and code. Selecting from the stack, as you can see, there are plenty of languages available. For us, we're gonna select Node 8.11. And then finally, I'm going to click this app service plan and create a new one specifically for this. We'll name it. It should be familiar to you by now. Do SRE 10 AMS manual deploy. And then finally, select West Europe. Your locations and regions will change based on where you are. Everything looks good, click OK, 
And then we're going to create this. It'll pop up an alert to let you know that it's actually deploying. And you can click into it to see it actually run deployment in progress. Succeeded. And you can actually click. There's lots of options to kind of see under the hood what's actually happening, logs, um, actual files. So I encourage you to click around and just kind of familiarize yourself with how to get more visibility into the process. So that's pretty easy, correct? How many of you have done something very similar? OK, a fair amount of you. If you don't, you know, going clickety-clackety all over the portal, perhaps you're most comfortable in the terminal. I want to look at how you deploy via a templated script directly from there. OK, so same kind of thing. We're right here in the portal. The same deployment. It's complete. And again, you can kind of go in and look at all these files from there. That has really helped me connect with what is actually going on between my computer and the cloud as I'm kind of learning that process. I'm going to open a Cloud Shell directly in the portal, which I have learned to love Cloud Shell. It's fantastic. I'm going to go to the correct location, and then I'm going to open it up in VS Code directly from the portal. You can look at the template we're using. Some of these names should look familiar, SRE 10 AMS template deploy, as well as the location and subscription. Finally, we'll go over to the deploy script so you can kind of get an idea of what this would look like for you. The docs, again, have lots of examples for this um, as you try and build out your own. Finally, I'm going to set that subscription right there and then deploy the script, being sure to include the name, the location, subscription. We'll see this pile on through. And again, this can take a few minutes, so I've sped things up a little bit. All right, you can see the file it actually ran through, and it succeeded. We'll go back into the portal to actually confirm that, because I almost never trust messages. <laughs> we'll actually go to resource groups and search. SRE 10, and then you'll see as the second option is that templated deploy. Click in there. It should look very familiar, very similar to the manual deploy we just did. So again, there are lots of options for this, and it, it allows your team to function as your team naturally functions, and the culture you have and the personal preferences each of your engineers have. Now that you have a better idea of what provisioning and deploying infrastructure in Azure looks like, I want to chat about CI, CD. CICD stands for Continuous Integration and Continuous Delivery, sometimes deployment. I guess it should be CI, CD, CD. With Continuous Integration, development work is integrated into releasable chunks of code multiple times per day. So you're making small, little batches, which is much easier to maintain. You'll use an automated test suite and other tools to ensure proper functionality before actually delivering that software to a production environment or your customers. If you've ever heard of Circle CI, this is what that's referring to. These are the tools that help you get there. In continuous delivery, a human will push the button that actually releases a build to customers. But the release itself is built using an automated pipeline. So it's essentially an automation tool up to a certain point, and then it needs human approval to proceed. From the point your code is integrated into your trunk or master branch in source control, it will build and be production ready. Essentially, you're sitting in a pre-deployment phase all the time. In continuous deployment, however, it takes it one step further. And if you're very brave, you can release automatically if every gate along your pipeline is passed. That includes any kind of test for functionality, security, performance, code standards. Whatever you want to check along that pipeline, 
to ensure your software is deploy ready. Essentially, if you commit code, it's in production. Small batches of code are key to DevOps. If you release small builds, it makes it much less likely that you'll have a major outage or incident from the deploy. Not impossible, but less likely. It also makes it simpler to identify bugs if something does go wrong. Think about it. If you release 30 lines of code, that is much better, a much smaller set of changes to have to look at when evaluating what could have gone wrong, what could have impacted other parts of your system. Certainly much better than hundreds or thousands of lines of new changes, additions, deletions, any of which could have impacted the system, depending on how tightly coupled everything is. With small batches, fewer bugs are introduced, and the bugs that do make it in are typically smaller, certainly more easy to manage. It reduces the risk for the team, while also enabling engineers to deliver features faster and receive feedback from customers before a full feature or product is actually developed, so that you don't end up releasing something that took two years but isn't valuable. Finally, it helps for, to prevent or reduce the number of late night or weekend deploys. When you deploy all the time, you practice deploying all the time, which means you're comfortable. It's not an every two week process or worse, every, every quarter process where you're having to go through this huge event. I wanna look at CICD in practice, what it actually looks like to use CICD with infrastructure as code as well as an application. In this example, I've pre-built a basic release pipeline with three environments, development, user acceptance testing, and production. The infrastructure, you'll see it as web app infra, will begin to build once a pull request is merged into master. It will automatically deploy the change to dev and UAT, but will stop before deploying to production. An engineer must actually go and physically approve the release before that actually proceeds. If you recall, this is an example of continuous. Yes, delivery. <laughs> okay, let's take a look. So I'm in my terminal. I'm gonna open up um, web app infra in VS Code. I recognize this is going to be hard to see in the back. That's okay. This is not the important bit. The important bit is that I am changing something in the infrastructure code. Basically, all we're doing is moving the SKU and the SKU code from variables to parameters. So up here, it says parameters. I'm gonna add that data in. Make sure everything's lined up because, you know. And then we're gonna go down to these variables where it used to be listed and change those values. So delete them from the variables because we moved them into parameters and then to make sure that it's calling the correct spot to actually get those values. In the lower half left uh, hand side of code, you'll notice that there is a branch. So I made a feature branch when we first started. It makes it very easy to integrate with Git and make sure that you're managing everything directly from code. So I've made that feature branch. I'm going to make this commit message right here. I'm just parameterizing the SKUs. And then I can actually push from right down here. But there's a quick little warning. I need to fix a little date. I love that it gives you those warnings and kind of helps you along the process without bouncing around to a bunch of different places. So we'll fix this, commit one more time, and then push up before going over to the portal and actually making a pull request. Just committing that we fix that date. Okay, and then we're gonna hop back over to Azure DevOps. You can see that it's already seen. We've had pushed code. You can hop right into that and create this pull request right there. Leave a commit message, um, tag people, see the diff right there in line or compared. 
And then we're going to create that. This is what um, a colleague would see if they go to review that code, that pull request, um, and then go to approve it. In this case, I'm going to approve my own pull request because that's great practice. I'm kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> All right, and then I'm a huge fan of deleting the branches after merging. Please do that. You can also um, rebase right from there if you need to. And right here, you can see, you can go back to these commits and cherry pick and revert, um, which will be helpful depending on what kind of situation you're dealing with. I find the portal, um, once you get a rhythm with it, it's extremely useful and pretty intuitive. Okay, so you can see that the pull request actually kicked off this pipeline deploy. This is a release pipeline. And it's moving through, but it holds a production and requires approval. The person, you can actually um, require that certain people have to approve, depending on how you structure your culture and your team. But the approver will just go in there, approve the process, look at everything, and at that point, it will release into that production environment. So, let me find my mouse. There we go. Okay. So that's continuous delivery. Pretty simple, right? Perhaps you're feeling extra confident and you want to build out the robust automated test suite. You've integrated various security checks along your release pipeline and you want to release directly to customers in production when new code is merged into your master or trunk branch. That would be continuous. Be, thank you. <laughs> Deployment. OK, so we're going to do the same thing. Now, last time I was edit editing the infrastructure code. This time, I'm actually going to be editing the front end code. So same kind of process. I'm going to open it up in VS Code. And again, these changes are not important. The important bit is that I'm actually just going to change the title of the index. So I'm just adding Amsterdam to it. And then I am going to commit directly to master because we believe in good source control. All right, so I'm going to be brave, committing to master. We can push directly up just as we did the last time. But the process is going to be a little bit different. And because I've committed directly to master, I don't need to go in and do that pull request. Truly, please do not do that. <laughs> OK, and you can see it run through um, the actual pipeline. It's going to archive those old environments, what used to be the builds there repopulate each. If something fails, I have found this incredibly useful because you can actually find the spot that it failed, open up that log, and get more information. As I've been learning this, this has been super helpful. OK, so you can see all the steps. Then we're going to go back over to our pipeline, see the release. And that front end release is built. These usually take four to five minutes, given this app. But you can see it pop through each stage. And in this case, we're not going to pause before production. So it's not, there's no approval. It's trusting that this pipeline has made sure that all the code is up to snuff. And then it'll deploy directly into that production environment. Azure is an incredibly powerful tool. The more I dig into it, the more I realize it is incredibly robust. And there is not, it's not possible to be an expert in Azure because there's simply so many services. I think there are advantages to implementing multiple services within the Azure ecosystem because it's simply a more seamless integration and setup. But Azure is not the only tool out there, and we recognize that. We recognize that your stacks are incredibly diverse. 
We work really hard to ensure that whatever stack you use fits into Azure pipelines. You can call REST APIs from any of the steps to integrate with different systems, as well as double check the code, meet certain standards from linting to security. I believe you are the future of tech, and I want to make sure that I and Azure help to get you there. Please stick around for the next four sessions of the SRE track. There's a bit of repetition in a few of them simply to bring newcomers up to speed, but each session does build on the next. And we'll move through this intro into monitoring and dealing with problems as you respond to fires, as well as learning from failure. If you need the slides or code, you can visit these links. And finally, as someone who is passionate about DevOps, I believe in an open space style. So I've left plenty of time. I'm going to be up in front of the stage. If you want to come talk, chat with me, you can ask me specific questions um, or just meet some of your colleagues and figure out what they are doing at their uh, companies. Again, my Twitter is at EditingEmily. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming and having us. Thank you.